It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far, and I hope to see you Sunday, if at all possible. We have two services again, as we did this past Sunday for the first time in quite some time. So we have one service at 9 a.m. and then again at 10.30 a.m. live and in person. And one thing that's been a bit shocking to me in all of this is that the 9 a.m. service has been more popular than the 10.30 service. I was not expecting that when we started having two services last June. It reminds me of worshiping with the Goodlettsville congregation many years ago when they had an early, early service. And I can't remember if it was at 5 or 6 a.m., I just remember it was very early. We were traveling. It was nice to get out there, get on the road after worship early in the morning, making our way back to Wisconsin. There were just a, a dozen or so of us at that early service, but they were all nurses and firefighters and cops. And then the four of us in our family, we were there, but it was a neat thing that they did for a number of years there at the Goodlessville congregation. But uh, anyway, I just say that to point out, I was surprised that the earlier service was more popular with the Four Lakes congregation. So either 9 a.m. or at 10.30 this coming Sunday, uh, this would be a good time to take a moment to sign up online. If you don't have internet access, if you need any help with that sign up process, please get in touch either with me or with Kenna. And thank you so much for your help with this. It helps us to plan for visitors. We've had a number of visitors over the past several weeks, and it's nice to be able to know how many of our own people are coming at the two services so that we can make plans for that. So uh, thank you again for your help with this. Tonight, we are getting back to our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, was most likely written by Luke, and it is volume two of a two-volume set, with Luke being volume one, a record of the life of Jesus, and then Acts being volume two, the history of the early church. We know Luke is a medical doctor. He writes both books to a man by the name of Theophilus, maybe a wealthy sponsor, maybe a new convert, maybe somebody who was simply interested in the Christian faith, somebody who wanted to know more. Uh, up to this point in the book of Acts, we have looked at chapter one, which we are summarizing in the ABCs of Acts as ascension. And so Jesus ascends back into heaven. We could also summarize Acts 1 by saying apostle appointed. That would also be a very good, very accurate summary of chapter 1 as the apostles pick a replacement to replace Judas as an apostle. Uh, last week, we also made it through the first half of Acts chapter 2, and we noted that Acts 2 records the beginning of the church. And so for chapter 2, the B there stands for beginning of the church. And if you have a better one than that, I hope that you will share it. I will admit, though, that beginning of the church, that's going to be hard to beat for chapter 2. This is what that chapter is about, the beginning of the Lord's church. Several years ago, I heard Alan Hires present a series of lessons on Acts chapter 2 at Polishing the Pulpit. And he refers to this chapter as the hub of the Bible. And almost like spokes pointing out from the hub of a wheel, everything in the Bible points toward Acts chapter 2. The Old Testament prophecies point to the future. John the Baptist in his ministry says that the kingdom is coming. Jesus says that the kingdom is coming. It's in the future. And then after Acts 2, almost all references to the kingdom refer to the kingdom as something that has already been established. It is something already in place. And so Acts chapter 2 truly is the hub of the Bible because it is the beginning of the Lord's church. In Acts 2, we had the 12 apostles baptized with the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit comes down and descends upon them, almost like uh, something that appears to be tongues as a fire, uh, people come together after hearing the noise like a violent rushing wind. The apostles start, start speaking in the languages of those who had assembled from all around the Mediterranean world for the celebration of the, of the uh, holiday of Pentecost. Pentecost was that Jewish holiday 50 days after Passover and traditionally celebrated the giving of the Law of Moses on Mount Sinai on the anniversary date of that happening. Last week, I just briefly noted that Isaiah 2 Daniel 2 and Joel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts 2, and that's very easy for many of us to remember with it kind of going along rhyming, I guess we might say like that. And you may remember I read that passage from Isaiah chapter 2. I want to read that again and just point something else out there. Isaiah chapter 2 says, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills, 
and all the nations will stream to it, and many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Just a few comments on this before we jump back into Acts. Remember, Isaiah describes all the nations as streaming to Jerusalem so that the God of Jacob may teach us his ways. And then he says that the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And I just want us to remember that that is exactly what happens here. On this holiday commemorating the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai, here we have Peter and the other apostles are now preaching the new law starting from Jerusalem to this huge group of people who have streamed into the city of Jerusalem exactly as Isaiah had prophesied. So I just want to make sure that we didn't miss that from last week. A lot of parallels between Isaiah 2 and Acts chapter 2. Nevertheless, when the people hear the apostles speaking in these various languages, some assume they are drunk. Uh, Peter gets up, stands up to speak at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, though, and he explains that they are not drunk. It is too early to be drunk. And then he goes on to explain by saying, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes that passage about God in Joel 2, pouring forth his spirit and the wonders in the sky and whoever calls on the name of the Lord being saved. And then he explains this. He turns his attention to Jesus, his signs and wonders, his death. You people killed the Lord. But then God raised him up. And so he's preaching the gospel, isn't he? Peter is. Uh, the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then he starts quoting a prophecy from David, talking about God not abandoning his soul to Hades, nor allowing his Holy One to undergo decay. And that's where we left off last week, some quotes from David from Psalm number 16. So tonight let's pick up with what comes next as Peter applies this passage that he's been quoting now from Psalm number 16. So let's continue tonight with Acts 2, 29 through 32. So we made it halfway through Acts 2 last week. We pick up halfway through with verse 29. Acts 2, verses 29 through 32. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. So I know we've spanned from one week to another, but let's just remember in the verses leading up to this, right before this, we had that quote from David about God not allowing his soul to remain in Hades or for his Holy One to undergo decay. And here, Peter states what I think is very obvious to everybody standing there on that day, that David is dead. And not only is David dead, but his decomposing body is still right over there in that tomb. Apparently, they all knew where the tomb was. And so his body is right there. And at that point, they still knew where David was buried. They could have looked, or they, they could have dug him up. They could have seen his bones in that tomb. And so Peter is saying, David is still here. At least his body is. So Peter continues, and he argues that since David was a prophet, and because he knew that God had sworn to put one of his descendants on his throne, David was actually looking ahead to Jesus in that passage that Peter just quotes about God not abandoning him to Hades, nor, nor allowing his flesh to undergo decay. And in case there was any doubt, Peter just straight up says it in verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And so Peter is applying this passage, and he's saying that the prophet David, King David, was not talking about himself, obviously, because he's dead and his bones are right over there, but rather he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. 
And nobody can dispute this. This is a very public claim that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. But notice nobody interrupts here. Nobody speaks up here because everybody knows that it's true. Some amazing things have happened in Jerusalem over the past 50 days. And now Peter is tying it all together and explaining what all of this means. So let's continue on tonight with Acts 2, verses 33 through 36. Acts 2, verses 33 through 36, as Peter continues preaching. He says, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In verse 33 then, Peter reminds us of what we know. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he took his place at the right hand of God. That's a place of honor, exalted, as Peter says. And as promised, Jesus has now poured forth the Holy Spirit in a way that these people can now both see and hear. And so multiple senses are involved here, correct? The sound of the wind, the tongues as a fire over their heads, and now, of course, Peter and the other apostles speaking in these various languages. And to make sure that we're clear on this, Peter makes sure we know that it was not David who ascended into heaven. That's not who this prophecy is about, but it was Jesus who did that. And so we have David speaking of one of his descendants, saying that the Lord, God the Father, said to David's Lord, David's descendant, Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Well, I think this is probably familiar to most of us because back in Matthew 22, uh, Jesus uses this passage from Psalms during a run-in with the Pharisees. And I know we haven't studied Matthew lately, but we just finished up the book of Luke. And I know I remember just a couple months ago bringing this in from Matthew. And over in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was having this argument with the Pharisees. There was some back and forth going on there. And Jesus quoted this passage and then he asked if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And so that's a, a thought question. The Pharisees were some very smart people. But Matthew at that point says no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Well, that's interesting. That was not too far back in the recent past. And so now Peter's using that same exact passage to prove that Jesus has now fulfilled the rest of that passage. He is now sitting at the Father's right hand, and his enemies are now a footstool for his feet. And we're the ones left behind on the footstool, aren't we? Well, in verse 36, Peter brings it all together. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You, all of you standing here today, are personally responsible for murdering the Son of God, who is now ruling in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. And note, unlike just a little bit earlier in this message, Peter doesn't put some distance here. You nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men. He doesn't have that separation. You did it through the Romans. He doesn't say that here. But here, he refers to this Jesus whom you crucified. And so there is no buffer, even though they didn't actually nail the nails into his wrists and so on. Um, they did. They were the ones who were directly responsible for this. These people did it. They personally murdered the Son of God by taking part in that. All right, let's notice what happens next because they interrupt. And so let's keep on going then to Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 41. Peter's not done yet. He's still talking, but this is where we come to Acts 2, 37 through 41. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So note upon hearing that they had murdered the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the people who hear this are pierced to the heart. And what we take from that is they felt it. They feel this. They understand what they have done. They understand the gravity of this situation. And so they can't take it anymore. They, they, they can't listen to this. And so they interrupt the Apostle Peter. Peter never invites them to come to the front as we stand and sing, does he? He never says that. He never gets to that point. Peter's not done yet, but these people interrupt his sermon. And they interrupt this sermon with a question. Brethren, what shall we do? Obviously, this is one of the most important questions that any of us could ever ask. To get to a point where we know that we've sinned, and to really, truly, in the bottom of our heart, need to know what to do about it. And so that's where these people are. They are convicted of sin. Back in John 16, 18, you may remember Jesus was telling the apostles about how the Spirit would come. And Jesus said, this is just a few weeks before this, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Well, in terms of the Spirit convicting us of sin, some people think that the Spirit convicts us of sin by whispering it to us, by communicating in some miraculous way, by changing our hearts, by affecting our hearts in some supernatural way. But that is not how it happens, is it? That's not what just happened in this passage. No, the Spirit convicted these people of sin through the preaching of Peter and the others. So they were convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, by hearing the Word of God preached and applied faithfully to their lives. So yes, they were convicted by the Spirit, just as Jesus said would happen, but not in a direct, miraculous kind of way. Rather, the Spirit worked through the Word of God as it was preached by Peter and the others. And that's how the Spirit convicts the world of sin today, through the Word, through the preaching of the gospel. That's why we put a value on preaching at the Four Lakes Congregation. This is uh, something that is important to us, and it's important to us because it is important to God. And so notice they ask an open-ended question. They're not asking, should we do this or should we do that? This was not a yes or a no. This is not something where they had a preconceived notion of what they needed to do, but they're simply opening it up and they're, they're asking because they don't know. What do we do? What, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And so they're desperate, and they know that they're also ignorant of what they really need to do. They're clueless here. And in response to that question, Peter gives a rather simple answer. The words that Peter speaks here, the words, they are not complex. This is not a very difficult answer that he gives in terms of the words that he uses. It may be difficult for us to obey this command, uh, but it's a rather simple answer. And I would also point out this is an answer that very few people today would give in response to the same question. And I, I've done this uh, talking to people in the religious world in general. I've talked to dozens upon dozens of religious leaders. And I've asked them this question, what must I do to be saved? And almost never will they give an answer that matches what Peter says here. Many people today will say, well, pray, receive Jesus in your heart as your personal Savior. Uh, any number of things may be spoken today. But I think when somebody comes to us and asks us this question today, what must I do to be saved or what do we do? Um, it's hard to beat the Apostle Peter here, right? It's good to go to Scripture. And so, in response to the question, Peter gives this very simple answer. And his answer is, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There's a promise here. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But for now, the answer has two parts, right? They must repent, and secondly, they must also be baptized for the forgiveness 
of their sins. Repentance and baptism are tied together as both being equally necessary for salvation. Well, at this point, some have wondered why Peter doesn't tell these people to hear the gospel. Remember, on Sunday, we've got our summary of God's plan. It starts with hear the gospel. And then we go on to believing the gospel. And so some would ask, well, why doesn't he tell these people to hear and believe or to have faith? And I think the reason is they already have. He's already preached the gospel. We noted that last week, that he was preaching the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. As to why didn't he tell them to believe? I believe at this point that they did believe. They did believe what Peter had said. That's why they were asking this question in the first place. And so uh, I think that just serves as a reminder to us that just because belief isn't mentioned here doesn't mean that it isn't necessary. Okay, let's keep that in mind. He doesn't tell them specifically to believe. And I point that out because we may come to another passage that says believe. And just because it doesn't say repent or be baptized, people will say, aha, all you have to do is believe. Well, I'm just saying the opposite of that. We can't do that to this passage either. We can't say just because he didn't say that you need to believe doesn't mean that that was not a, a necessary requirement. We take, need to take everything that the Bible uh, says on this issue. In fact, I can't really think of any scenario in the book of Acts where somebody is told absolutely everything in one dose that a person must do to be saved. But instead, we have to look at everything the Bible teaches on this and we need to take it all together. And we got to uh, not eliminate anything just because we don't like those particular commands or it doesn't fit in with a misunderstanding that we have from somewhere else. So the first step is repentance. And that word just refers to a change of mind, to change the mind, to do a U-turn, we might say, in the way that we speak, uh, to pull a U-turn, a, a change of heart. And this change of mind, this change of heart, obviously results in a change in the way we live. And so I would point out here, it's not just saying sorry for something, and it's not just sorrow over sin. These people were obviously feeling at least some level of sorrow before Peter tells them to do this. Does that make sense? He didn't say, feel sorry and be baptized. They already felt sorry. This is the next step. Sorrow, godly sorrow, leads to repentance, as Paul will go on to tell us later. And so repentance is more than just feeling bad for sin. Hopefully feeling bad for sin moves us toward repentance, where we feel the need to do that. And, and dig deeper on that. But this is an actual change of mind concerning sins that we've committed in the past. This is what I've done in the past. And now that I understand that it's wrong, I will change. My life will be different now. In one sense, this is something we do at a particular moment in time, right? As these people were told to do. This was There were some concrete steps they could take right then, right there, before they were baptized. It was a, a momentary thing. It was a moment in time where they were told to repent. But in another sense, I would also point out that this is ongoing. My change of mind concerning sin will cause me to take steps right now, but it's also a lifestyle of change going forward. And to illustrate, I think of driving on the, on the interstate. How often do we adjust the wheel as we're driving to keep the car between the lines? Well, if you pay attention, it's constantly, right? We may need to make a big turn to get on the ramp to get on the interstate in the first place. But from that point forward, we are constantly making adjustments. There's slight curves in the road. Our car might be weird. <laughs> Had some cars like that. Uh, wind and resistance. We just have to constantly adjust. And that seems to be what repentance is. It is a big change followed by a lifetime of change, a lifetime of adjustments to keep ourselves on the straight and narrow path. And it's a struggle. It's more of a struggle for some than others, but it is a struggle. Repentance is not easy. Repentance is one of the most difficult steps in God's plan. I might need to get help with this, and it might need to come before I'm baptized. For me or for other people, just speaking in general here, I might need help getting out of an addiction. I have a change of mind concerning this thing I'm addicted to, and I, I need to work on that. I might need to give up a relationship. It's not just a one-time thing. That's making a decision to turn and go in a different direction. Um, I might need to change about the way that I treat my family. 
if I'm just a mean person. And I didn't realize that before, but I read it in the scriptures and I see it and I think, wow, that's terrible. Uh, I need to adjust. I need to keep on doing the best I can to do better. I might need to have a change of mind concerning how I spend my money. I might be doing things with my money that are immoral. Uh, you know, repentance changes the way that I live. I, I see that this thing is a sin. I see that I'm doing it and I have a change of mind and therefore I do that U-turn. But it's not just a one-time change. It's something I may struggle with for the rest of my life. I hope that makes sense. Do we need to be perfect before we obey the gospel? No, we do not. But I believe we do need to know what sin is. And we need to actually do something about it. You may remember those who came to John the Baptist asking to be baptized. And, you know, there were a lot of people. Hey, will you baptize me? And many preachers would say, sure, let's do it. This guy wants to be baptized. Let's go down to the river. We're going to do it. But that's not what John does. In Luke 3, John says to people wanting baptism, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Remember that? And Luke then tells us that the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What should we do? And he said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. So when the people came to John for baptism, it sounds to me from the book of Luke that he often refused and said, No, I'm not baptizing you. Get out of here. Change your life. And then come back to me. You need to make some concrete changes first. That's, the, that's John the Baptist saying that. Because he understood as... Peter does here that repentance comes before baptism, doesn't it? Repent and be baptized. And so um, in Acts 2.38, what, what if the tax collectors, going back to the illustration with John the Baptist, and they come to John and he says, collect no more than you need to, that kind of thing. What if the tax collectors had responded uh, by saying, no, I... I kind of think I'm going to keep on collecting more than we've been ordered to. I, I kind of like my lifestyle. How do you think John the Baptist would have reacted to that? Well, he would have every right to refuse baptism. No, I'm not going to immerse you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You're still happy in your old sins. And so that's what he said. They needed to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. There needed to be a visible change in their lives based on that change in the way that they were thinking. And I would just point out here, the same goes for any other sin that we refuse to turn away from. Repentance is difficult. To confess Jesus in our culture today, it's getting a little more difficult, but it's still pretty easy. To say the words, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's easy. To be baptized, that's pretty easy. We're not in some desert right here. We find water, physically speaking, it's easy to be immersed and all that. It's easy to hear the gospel. All those other steps, fairly easy. It's repentance is where the hang up often is. Repentance is difficult. The second part of Peter's answer is that these people need to be baptized. I think Hugo McCord's translation has Peter saying, change your hearts and be immersed. And I love that. The word baptism refers to an immersion in water. The root of the word baptism means to dip. That's what the word means. Sailors in the ancient word would use the word to refer to the sinking of a ship as it was immersed in the water. The, the ship was being baptized, literally, when it went down. Uh, we know what that word means, but what's special about this passage is that Peter gives us the purpose of it. We learn something about baptism that we don't have in some of the other passages. We are to be baptized. Why? What's the reason? For the forgiveness of your sins. So I would just note that we are baptized, not because we have already been saved, but we are baptized for the purpose of forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins. The same phrase, by the way, is used in Matthew 26, 28, 
When Jesus introduces the fruit of the vine at the Last Supper, he explains that this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Let's think about that for a moment. If we say that for the forgiveness of sins means that we're baptized because we've already been forgiven, then must we also say that Jesus' blood was poured out because our sins have already been forgiven? And that's about as far away from the truth as we can possibly get. And I say that because just as Jesus' blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, so also we are baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That is the purpose of it. Not because forgiveness has already happened, but in order to accomplish the forgiveness of sins. By obeying his command to be immersed, we are accepting the offer of his blood for our forgiveness. We don't earn it. It is the farthest thing from earning salvation. But we accept the gift of forgiveness on his terms, not on ours. In the last part of verse 38, not only do we have the promise of forgiveness, but Peter also says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't have time to do a comprehensive study of what this means, but whatever it means, all of us listening tonight, I believe, would agree that this is a good thing, right? It, we obey the gospel, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That It's a good thing. It's not a negative thing. It's positive. Some have suggested that Peter is referring to the miraculous gifts in this context, and yet it seems to me from John or from Acts 8 that the miraculous abilities, like speaking in tongues, were not automatically given at the time of baptism, but they were transmitted through the laying on of the apostles' hands. We'll get to that in a few weeks. So I just want to point that out here at the beginning, um, that this does not seem to be a reference to the miraculous gifts immediately upon baptism. I mean, some people have made that argument. I, I wouldn't say that they were terrible people for making that argument, but we would disagree on that. But we would agree um, that uh, we would agree on some things that it doesn't mean. Uh, some have suggested that the gift of the Spirit is just another way of referring to the Word of God. And so when you repent and you're baptized, God will give you the gift of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And yet, to me on this one, that seems a little bit backwards, because if you look down at verse 40, we find that those who had received his word were baptized. And so it's not the other way around. We receive the word, and James talks about it like sprouting like a seed. We receive the word implanted, which is able to save our souls. So it seems like the word comes first. It's not that the gift of the Spirit in this verse is the word, because they received the word before they were baptized. I hope that makes sense then. The word comes first, then baptism, not baptism, then the word. Uh, some have suggested that the gift of the Holy Spirit is salvation itself. Possibility that that's it. To me, that seems a little bit redundant because he's already said that repentance and baptism results in the forgiveness of sins. And so I go back to the last part of verse 38, and the way I look at this, I just need to agree with Peter here. When we repent and when we're baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, it is good, and we would really need to go to a number of other passages to clarify exactly what that means. Whatever it means, notice how Peter says in verse 39 that this promise is not limited to these people, but it is for those who repent and those who are baptized, not just on that day, but for their children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Based on what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, God calls us how? Through the gospel, that is, through the good news. Again, it's not the Holy Spirit coming and working on our heart miraculously or whispering in our ear what we need to do, but we are called through the gospel. And here Peter says that this promise is for their children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And that reference, I believe, is to the gospel or the good news. So this, this offer of forgiveness, this offer of the Holy Spirit, it is available to all people of all time. Whenever they hear the gospel message preached and whenever they obey it, this is God's offer going forward. And notice what happens next. I want us to notice that the people are not baptized right away in verse 38, are they? It doesn't happen right there. But instead, we have an interesting statement down in verse 40. 
and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So he tells them to repent and be baptized. But before they are actually baptized, he tells them exactly what repentance looks like. That's how I would take this passage. It's almost very similar, I think, to what John the Baptist did, right? He told them to repent, and then he told them exactly what that means. And I know it's easy to miss this in this passage. Sometimes people will say, uh, well, on the day of Pentecost, Peter didn't tell them to do this, this, and this. He just baptized him. Really? Because it seems like he did. In verse 40, between the command and the baptisms, Peter seems to go into great detail concerning what I'm assuming to be the most popular sins of that generation. Uh, Years ago, I shared what I hope was a fictional story about a preacher in a small town down south who started preaching at a new congregation. And that first Sunday, he preached against gambling and the horse races and spoke out against running moonshine stills and all this, okay? So that was his opening sermon, his first day he was hired. Well, a week later, he preached the exact same thing. It's a sin to gamble on the horses and the moonshine and... And the third week, he he preached the exact same thing. And finally, somebody pulled him aside and said, you need to stop preaching on those things. You're, You're stepping on our toes with this. And the preacher said, so what should I preach on then? And the man replied, you need to preach about those heathen witch doctors. We don't have any of them within a thousand miles of here. And I hope you understand what that story is teaching. Preaching repentance It needs to address the sins that we are actually committing. This involves stepping on toes. It involves stepping on the preacher's own toes a lot of times. And um, like John did, and like Peter apparently did here, we need to be specific. If If we were together, I might ask, how are we sinning in Madison these days? That's always a fun conversation to have. I don't know, it's kind of hard to... Hard to be honest with that, maybe. And uh, I heard a few years ago a preacher, instead of asking like for sermon request, how are you sinning? He asked it this way. What are your friends struggling with these days? And I love that because it's not me who has this sin. It's my friends. <laughs> my friends are the messed up weird people. At least uh, that gave them some cover for making those sermon requests. And I, I appreciate that. But how are we sinning? Are, are we struggling today with the the heathen witch doctors, or we got moonshine still set up in the woods? You know, that, I don't know about some of you. Um, I'm pretty good in that area. I'm okay with that right now. I don't, I don't have that going on, but I got some other stuff going on and you got some other stuff going on. What are we dealing with? What are we dealing with as a culture? What do we need to be covering? What would we preach if we were Peter exhorting them with many other words, be saved from this perverse generation? Well, probably one of the biggest issues in our society right now is materialism, greed, wanting more and more and more stuff. You know, just always wanting more, not being satisfied. And he addressed that with, uh, I think it was the soldiers, right? Be content with your wages. That's hard. That's one of those things they had to have a change of heart about right there at the beginning. And uh, beyond that, in our culture today, what else do we struggle with as a culture? All kinds of sexual sins, right? Pornography. Uh, We could go in the direction of divorce. Look at the statistics on that. Um, Alcohol. Just on and on and on. Um, And so I'm just pointing out between the command to be baptized and the actual baptisms, we need to be following Peter's example here by covering some of these things that we as a culture are actually struggling with. At the end of the paragraph, we have the results. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Remember how we learned earlier that the day of Pentecost was a time when the people commemorated the anniversary of the giving of the Law of Moses on Mount Sinai? And do you remember what happened when Moses was up there on the mountain getting the law? What were the people doing down below? Down below, the people were building a golden calf. Remember that? And they worshipped it. And when Moses came back down, he smashed the tablets Um, The only person I know other than my wife who's broken all Ten Commandments at once. Um, Yeah, she uh, had a little class project downstairs at church one time and wrote out the Ten Commandments on some tiles from maybe Habitat for Humanity and had them written out there. And they went out in the back stairwell and she 
She smashed him like Moses did. I bet those kids probably still remember that. A little bit traumatized there. Um, but that's what they were doing when the law was first given. And remember, the day of Pentecost is commemorating that event on its anniversary. And if you remember, Moses ground up the golden calf into dust. He made the people drink it. And then he told the Levites to take their swords and to start killing people, which they did. And by the time they were done, do you remember how many people died that day? Exodus 32, 28 says, So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. And so at the giving of the first law, 3,000 people died. But at the giving of the new law, 3,000 people were given new life, and they were born again. That is an amazing contrast. And I'm thinking there is no way that that is coincidence. Let's continue tonight with Acts 2, verses 42 through 45. Acts 2, 42 through 45. Look at what happens next. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. So we have this new group of 3,000 believers having just been baptized. This is what they do. They continually devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And that's a pretty good outline for what we need to be doing. I was looking at another church's website uh, earlier today, and I noticed in the about section, this is <laughs> this is what they're about. This is their this is what they do as a congregation. This is who we are. We are an Acts 2, 42 and following kind of congregation, and that this is an awesome outline. On a daily basis, we need to be studying the Bible, devoted to the apostles' teaching. We need to be encouraging each other, coming together to break bread. We need, we need to be praying. Let's remember that these are people who have come in from all over the world uh, for Pentecost. And so they're far away from home. They're staying longer than they planned on staying. And so they shared with each other. The locals perhaps providing a place to stay. They share their possessions, some even selling property and possessions to help take care of each other. Uh, I'm thankful that, that I have seen this happen with my own eyes. I have seen people sell property at this congregation to help their fellow Christians. We should note this is not communism of some kind. A lot of people you know, point, ah, look, they were communist. Uh, no, uh, this is voluntary, isn't it? This is not the government demanding everything and then redistributing it equally. This is individual Christians voluntarily taking care of each other. That's what's going on here. Uh, just a quick note on verse 43, when Luke says that everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, uh, this is probably another argument against the gift of the Spirit from verse 38 being the ability to perform miracles. If all 3,000 were immediately given the power to perform miracles, I'm thinking we probably wouldn't see an emphasis on the apostles doing that here. Instead, these signs and wonders would be done by everybody. Uh, but that doesn't seal the deal or anything, but I'm just pointing it out as something that seems to tie back to what we learned earlier, something at least to consider here. Uh, the main point of this passage is the new Christians are dedicated to the Lord, they're dedicated to his word, they're dedicated to each other, and so they share with each other. They take care of one another. Let's conclude tonight with Acts 2, 46 and 47. Acts 2, 46 through the end here. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. The emphasis here is that they did these things on a daily basis. From time to time, um, my wife and I will look back at a week and, you know, we're just exhausted after a, after a week. And, and we'll say to each other, that was an Acts, <laughs> that was an Acts 246 week. And, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes we have the privilege of getting together with our Christian family somewhere or another every single day. And again, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. Those weeks are exhausting, but they are incredibly rewarding when Christian people get together on a daily basis. It is an awesome thing. In verse 47, they are praising God and having favor with the people, and so they worshiped. 
and people seem to like them. What do we learn from that? Christians were not mean people. They had favor with the people. And so they were people you wanted to be around. Jesus was a person that most normal people wanted to be around. He was likable in a sense. And the reason is they probably lived by the golden rule, treating people just as they would like to be treated. That is an amazing thing. The golden rule works. And at the end, so don't be a jerk, I guess, would be a, a lesson we could take from this. At the end of this chapter, the growth of the early church continues. Remember, that's what Acts does. It traces, traces the growth of the church. We start with 3,000, actually start with 11, then we add one to get 12. We had the 120 that were together, then we have the 3,000 jump on board, and then the people continue to be added to the church on a daily basis from that day forward. Uh, just another note on this, God did the adding. God is the one who adds people to the church. Uh, many years ago, we visited a church of more than a thousand people. A young man uh, came forward to be saved on that day. Uh, we were just there to observe. And this young man came forward to be saved. He supposedly accepted Jesus into his heart as his personal savior, although that phrase is never used in scripture. But then the pastor of that church turned to the audience, this huge group of people, and asked the people to raise their hands to accept him as a part of that church. Okay? So God supposedly forgave his sins, and then the people added him to the church. Okay, a two-step process there. That is not what we find going on in Acts chapter 2. As people turned from sin, as they were baptized, as their sins were forgiven, God added them to the church. Baptism uh, certainly wasn't something that they only did on a quarterly or an annual basis, as we sometimes see with various man-made religious groups today. Next week, let's pick up with Acts chapter 3. And remember, please be thinking of a word starting with C that summarizes what happens in chapter 3. Other than chapter 3. I, let's not resort to that, but uh, the one I have I'm not a fan of. Let me know beforehand if you can. Uh, also, if you haven't done it already, even if you have, try to either read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. Uh, that'll help us understand what's going on in the whole book. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you all on Sunday, either at 9 or at 1030. And again, right now would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help. Get in touch with Kenna if you need help with that also. Let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we are in awe of your plan for our salvation your plan for your kingdom, the church. We're thankful for your plan for saving us. Most of us participating in class tonight most likely have already obeyed the gospel, but we know that repentance is an ongoing process. We pray that we would always be sensitive to sin as your people and that we would continually turn away from it. We pray that we might have the courage and the wisdom to tell others, and we pray that as your people, we would take care of each other as we should taking time to check in on each other and using our resources to help each other in any way that we can. Tonight, we're thankful for our Christian family here in Madison. When we struggle personally, we pray that we would have enough faith in our brothers and sisters to reach out for help and for encouragement. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.